Good evening. My uh, privilege and pleasure to welcome you as we gather tonight. Uh, I will say this is one of my favorite services, and so I, it is a joy to get to share it with you. I hope Holy Week is going well for you. I would remind you that just as we are worshiping out of our normal time tonight, we will have the sunrise service on uh, Easter morning, and so I look forward to sharing that with you as well. Uh, as we gather together, let's open up in prayer. Pray with me. Great and loving God, we gather together as your people, and we offer ourselves in worship to you. We come before you and we come into your place, and part of what we do together as a family is we remember. We remember that you gave yourself into the hands of others so that all might know what it is to live. We remember that you gathered with your disciples together on your last days and just enjoyed being together with them. We remember that you took a towel, you washed feet, you humbled yourself, and you called us to remember that life is one of service. We remember that you gave us a feast, and we were reminded again and again that all that we have comes from you. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we gather. Let us dream together of that day with you when all of us are able to gather together at your table and eat and drink together in peace. In your name we pray. Amen.
20. Let's stand together and let's sing. Please be seated. I don't know about you, but I am ready for Easter. Singing of wormwood and death and all that is not my favorite part of Lent. If you were like me, you rush too quick to the tomb, and it is easy to assume all is good. Confession reminds us that that is not always the case, and so we confess now as the people. That will take us into the Lord's Prayer and then a moment of silence to say anything else. Pray with me. Eternal God, we confess that we fail to fulfill your will. We refuse to bind ourselves to you. We run from your love. We hold love from others. Let your mercy wash over us again, that we might be forgiven and cleansed, united with you in ministry. In Jesus' name we pray as we've been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take a moment now in silence to say anything else.
The proof of God's love is this, is that God would give fully of God's self so that we and all of creation would know what it is to live. In Jesus' name, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Take a moment now to pass the peace to those around you. Our first reading comes from Paul's letter, first letter to the church in Corinth. We're in chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, and they go like this. I don't have them memorized. <laughs> For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Let's pray. We get it again. We thank you, great and loving God, for the chance to gather together, for the chance to come into your place, for the chance to remember, for the chance to return to your table, for the chance to eat and drink from your grace, from the chance to spend time in your word. And we just ask, Lord, now that you would speak to us. We're not picky about how you do, just that you speak. So that we might leave today with a better understanding of who we are and of whose we are. In your name we pray. So today, for most teams, was opening day in Major League Baseball. And I know you, like me, have been waiting for five months for today. I can sense your excitement. I am impressed that you are not at home watching games. I get some of your teams have already played, so you could be here to worship. And so because it is opening day, I'm going to start with a baseball reference. Tug McGraw was a pitcher, and he was a good one. He pitched for the Mets and for the Phillies. I think that is a sign of penance that he had done something wrong in his life to have to play for both of those teams, but still he did. He won a World Series with both. He made the All-Star team with both. He is in both of the organization's Hall of Fame, the Mets and the Phillies. He is not one of the elite of the elites. He didn't make Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, but he made theirs. He was good. He is also the father of Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw, country music star and actor. In 2003, Tug McGraw became sick and he was terminal. In 2004, Tim McGraw released Live Like You Were Dying. If it is not his most popular song, it is right close. I wrote this down because I want to make sure I get it right. It won song of the, single of the year that year. It won song of the year, and I don't know what the difference is between the two. And it won best country song of the year. If you know the song, you know what I'm talking about, but the gist of it is this. It is a conversation between a parent and a child once that parent knows that his or her time is short. And it's a coming to senses of the whole thing and the child asking, what did you do? What did you do when you knew? And the parent says, I started doing those things I've wanted to do. Skydiving, Rocky Mountain climbing, 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. But then he started talking about those other things that he did as well. Those things that were not on a bucket list, but that should be on life's generic list. Things like loving deeper, speaking sweeter, giving forgiveness that we deny. And then it ends with hope. A parent now saying words to a child to live by, but not just hope, but a charge. My hope, the parent says, is that you get to live one day like you're dying. And the expectation is, start now. That's the charge. If you are like me, you have wondered what those vast days for you might be like. If you are like me, you have been fortunate just to wonder. Tomorrow is not given to anyone, and yet... We've had a whole bunch of tomorrows. And in arrogance, I just assume tomorrow is going to come. We read today of one who is about to run out of tomorrows. 
at least in his earthly life, we read of Jesus and how he spent his last few days. We are on that Thursday of Holy Week, and our passage goes like this. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. So during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you don't know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Think through now that text with me. Thursday before he is to be arrested, knowing his time is short, what are those things that he did? He gathered with friends and shared a meal with them. He did so knowing one of them was going to betray him, one of them was going to deny, and all of them were going to flee by the end of the week. Still, he shared a meal with them, breaking bread and fellowship and all those things that happened around a table. He humbled himself, serving them, washing their feet. I know it was custom in the time, but gross. It was a way of showing love. Again, even to the one who would betray, the one who would deny and the others who would flee, he gave them all a chance. He gathered with them in hope. He spoke truth to them in love. He lived a lifetime on that Thursday night. I have never been a fan of the what would Jesus do fad. I'm glad it has died out. I always thought it was hokey. But these are things we can do. And the beautiful thing is we don't have to wait until we are near our ends to do them. And what we know in our heart of hearts is this. The more we do those things, the richer we will live. And so, too, will all those with whom we come in contact. Let's pray together. You've given us a model in so many different ways. Even until the end, which, of course, we know was not your end. And so we ask, Lord, again, that you would open us to you and to your living and to your life and how we might follow in those footsteps and in the process, bring others to your table. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we come to that table now, and we read the words from Paul who described that night. 
how Jesus took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said to his people, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and eat all of it. And after doing that, he poured out the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and drink all of it. For as often as we eat together and we drink together, we offer a different reality to a world that desperately needs one. This is the feast of God for the people of God. And as we are all people of God, all are invited to the table. Normally, we come to the table through the aisles, grab the elements, and go back through the middle. We are an intimate crowd. Part of the beauty of gathering together at family meals is getting in each other's way. Come however you want. Go back however you want. Make sure, though, it is graceful and it is hopeful. If you would prefer not to come, just let us know. Somehow we will get the elements to you. Will our officers come and serve? When you are ready, come and eat. Again, all are invited. This is the cup of salvation. Did you get one? Let's pray together. The greatness, Lord, knows no bounds. And we gather together and we celebrate it. Neither does your grace, and we live fully into it. 
We thank you for the food that we have received and the care that you have given to provide it. And we just ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us so that we can do your work. Keep us dreaming of the day in which all are able to gather together and all of us have enough and there is more than enough left over. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and let's sing. The next time we gather, the tomb will be empty and we will celebrate the fact that life is God's final word for all of creation. Between now and then, you will come across someone who does not know this. Don't wait until Sunday to let them know. Amen. <laughs>